So today we're going to focus on heat pump technology for a couple of different reasons. One, it's a new and energy conscious uh, form of heating and cooling that some of you may re recognize on your houses. But number two, if you can understand how these work, then you can understand how any refrigeration or AC unit works. It's one of the most clear and uh, present forms of thermodynamics uh, happening in our everyday lives. So throughout this video, you'll see I'll be adding a couple things over to the right. I suggest that you pause and add them to yours as well. You don't need to go word for word, but you're going to want to get at least a good summary of anything that's going to be there. So most heating systems require some sort of, of fuel to be combusted. So we're used to like firewood or natural gas, propane, oil, things like that. These combust uh, fuel in the presence of oxygen to create water, carbon dioxide, and what we really want is that heat energy. We utilize the energy that is uh, going to be released to the surroundings for not only keeping us warm in our houses, uh, but also often for like steam dr driven electricity generation. So anytime you hear about fossil fuel electricity generation, it's because you're simply burning these things right here. Uh, biomass electrification, burning this stuff. Heat pumps are a little bit different, um, and they're a little less crude than your average combustion reaction. Because what these are going to do is rely instead on a closed loop physical change of substances rather than chemical reactions that we're used to with combustion. Um, if you've got electricity, these things are never going to run out of the stuff uh, that makes them work. Sorry, Ed the, Ed the cat is yelling at me right now. Um, this means no CO2 generation with direct use. So while you may make uh, carbon dioxide and emit it to the atmosphere for making the electricity, you're not going to by simply running these things right here off of that electricity. So if you can get it through renewable means, even better. So Heat pumps, they're exactly like refrigerators. I mean, the, the technology is virtually identical. Um, but we just want to imagine that, like, the inside of your fridge is like a tiny little room in your house that you like to keep really, really cold. Um, and I want us to keep in mind that energy is never created nor destroyed. It's just transformed. Fridges don't just make cold. Instead, they're really good at getting rid of heat. So if you ever were to touch the back of a fridge, be careful. They're hot. Um, because that's the spot that you're getting rid of all that extra energy that's inside that refrigerator there. It's got to go somewhere. So... Instead of dealing with chemical reactions to drive heat transfer, appliances like heat pumps, refrigerators, and air conditioners, these all rely on endothermic and exothermic physical processes, these phase changes to make the heat move around. So if you imagine you've got a bucket of, of water right here, so this is H2O as a liquid, and we want to turn it into H2O as a solid. All we're doing is changing the phase. We have got to release a bunch of heat get rid of it to the surroundings to make it turn into this ice here. So if you take a, a really hot bucket of water and put it outside in the middle of winter, you can see all that heat energy just being released off from it there. So to recap a little bit, when it, state, uh, the solids are going to be the least energetic state, and we need to add energy to them to get them to melt, to become a liquid, to add energy to it to then evaporate to become a gas. And if we took energy away, we could also run that in reverse, kind of like one big cycle here, one big loop. So you can see that these are the ones that are driven towards increases in energy. So to get towards melting and vaporization, we've got endothermic processes going on. And then reverse, we've got exo ones, because those are the ones that are giving off heat to the environment. So we've talked about the heat it requires for substances to achieve a higher energetic state of matter. Uh, if we add some energy, we can get something to go to a liquid, get it to go to a gas, maybe even eventually a plasma. It's the idea that if you, are, if you put it on the stove and add energy to it there and it rises to these other ones, they are endothermic. They're taking it in. So we also saw that acetone, it, that could really cool down a thermometer as it evaporated. It, it, some of them lost up to like 20 degrees there, taking in loads and loads of heat energy from the surroundings to make that phase change. And it just happened to be that the thermometer was the surroundings in which it took that heat from. The only problem is, though, in an open system like that, the evaporated substance is then lost to the surroundings. So that acetone just dissipates. It goes and evaporates and says, see you later. Um, but what if we were able to trap and harness those phase changes instead? Now comes our friend, refrigerants. So 
I guess friends, refrigerants, I don't know. But anyways, um, these are the fluids that are used for heat transfer in any kind of refrigerating system that are going to absorb heat during evaporation and release it during condensation. So this is the stuff, this Freon stuff that runs through the veins of your refrigerator, runs through your AC, runs through your heat pump, uh, <laughs> all of those different uh, places that we employ some kind of cooling there. And in the case of the appliances that specialize in heating and cooling, they employ this refrigerant in that closed loop that can be cycled over and over and over again. It just keeps going round and round and round. Other heat transferring fluids include like ethylene glycol, that's that's antifreeze, radiator fluid, and even water. If you think about water transferring heat, if you've ever seen the classic look of a nuclear power plant, that's just the spot where you've got the cooling towers uh, and water is being distributed throughout as well as air cooling happening. So the main takeaway of looking at this diagram of uh, a refrigeration cycle, um, and this shows the major components of a refrigerant-driven cooling system, is that all it takes is this little compressor, this little compressor right here that's driven by electricity to get the cycle moving, to make refrigeration happen. So if we condense that refrigerant here, and allow the exothermic heat, just like on the back of a fridge, to, give, to go away, to get rid of it, um, we are then left with something that is then able to go through and take in heat when it expands and evaporates. And then we just keep that cycle going. The only really moving part other than the refrigerant in your uh, refrigerator or a heat pump is that compressor. You hear it go, and that runs the whole system. The one problem is with this diagram, they do cold out, cold out now. That's not the case. Instead, we want to imagine that like the lower diagram shows, it's instead heat in and heat out because we're always tracing where heat goes, not where cold goes. So this one shows it a little bit better here. Um, so that you've got con uh, condensing happening here. If something condenses, it gets rid of the heat. It, uh, it then goes and expands and evaporates, takes heat in, and this cycle keeps going over and over and over again. You just want to make sure the evaporating part is sitting close to a refrigerator space that you want cooled. The other part is sitting outside. So imagine that we can take that process, uh, like with uh, acetone cooling that thermometer, and just have it happen over and over and over again here. So if we look at the phase diagrams happening here, enthalpy, think of that basically as kind of thermal energy here. Um, we can see how refrigerant follows these paths, one, two, three, four, where you've got this refrigerant fluid that then goes through is compressed, you increase the pressure on it. At that point, we set, start sending it through the system where it gets rid of that heat as it condenses here. It's then allowed to go into a low pressure environment with expansion. It takes all that heat in to heat it up again, and then we just keep running it around. So if we imagine overlaying this onto the one that we've talked about more in depth, we see that, oh, whenever we drive something in this direction with condensation, heat needs to dissipate, go away. That's like in the back of a fridge. If we then uh, allow it to expand, pressure decreases, it turns into a gas and evaporates, takes heat energy in, and we just keep going round and round in that circle. So this diagram basically shows us uh, that same thing, just a little bit more in depth with the different steps where you have the evaporator that extracts the heat from the room, the compressor, okay, that's the only thing that's actually doing work on your fridge, condenser, uh, that's when you get rid of that extra energy and the expansion of valve, this lets you then go and start the process anew here. And you can see that you are cooling off the room, you're extracting more energy than the energy that you're spending to make the process run. So if we double back to heat pumps now, these things are really great for heating and for both cooling our houses as well. Because if we think about the placement of where the compression happens and where the expansion happens, we can control whether or not we're cooling a space or we're warming it up. Heat pumps are incredibly versatile because they can be used as both heaters and air conditioners then. What we do is we just switch around where we utilize the phase changes and simply run the process in reverse. So these things can work in both the winter time to take heat energy out, because remember that has a very low boiling point, that uh, refrigerant there, we're able to run it through this system and, and draw heat even when it seems like it's really cold outside and heat our houses. The same thing can happen where we can take heat out of our inside here if we run it in reverse and dissipate that heat out to the environment like an air conditioner. 
So long story medium, as I say, uh, an air conditioner works in exactly the same way, but just in one direction. We can't reverse our air conditioners like we can the fancy heat pumps here. Uh, when you switch the air conditioner from just being a, a fan, so you've ever had it in just fan mode before, and you turn it to actual cooling mode, you can hear the uh, compressor actually kick in. So that'll kick on the compressor, and that's when you hear the different kind of tone the air conditioner makes because the phase changes start happening. Those phase changes start delivering heat from inside your house out the back of it there. So really, if you were in a pinch, you could technically heat your house with your air conditioner if you turned it around um, and basically created a mini heat pump. That energy has to go somewhere, and that's why that back of it always goes out a window or you have to have some sort of event. It's impossible to take one of these things, and I, I've seen it happen before, and put it in the middle of a room and expect it to cool the room off if you just plug it in. You can't plug something in to make cold, okay? The energy's got to go somewhere. So if you're adding energy to this air conditioner, expect that you can have one side that's cool, but another side that's going to be hot. Um, so don't ever just put it on a table in the middle of your room. It ain't going to work. Thank you.